daddy was a pretty tough nut. Hi, my name's Johnny, and today I want to talk about one of the Third Reich's greatest mysteries. And now, a sneak peek of an all-new hunting Hitler. No, 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 not a, not a shitty History Channel show. Today I want to talk about the Sturmpanzer VI, or the Sturm Tiger. The story for this infantry support vehicle actually starts before the war. The German army had always liked the idea of equipping its infantry with low-velocity vehicles that could help them deal with problems that they ran into. The first of these was the Stug 3B, armed with the 75mm Stu K 37L24, and then later on you have the Broombear, mounted on the chassis of a Panzer IV with a 150mm L12 gun. So later on, as German tanks were getting bigger and bigger, it made more sense that they would make more of these vehicles that also became bigger and bigger. And the next one in the line is the Sturmtiger, made on the chassis of a Tiger I. This vehicle was to mount a 380mm Sturm Morser RW61 L5.4 gun, developed from a depth charge thrower. That is one big pilot. Panzer. This actually, unlike other vehicles, was a rocket propelled system that had a two stage firing mechanism. The first stage would blow the projectile clear from the barrel, and the second stage would be a solid fuel system put in the projectile that would launch it forward and towards the target. And this massive 350 kilo or 770 pound projectile was rated at being able to crash through about 8 feet of concrete, with the ability to raise most hardened defenses to the ground. The large casemate for this weapon was put on large Tiger I surplus hulls that were taken from damaged vehicles that had already seen service on the front and 17 of the 18 built were built on late war Tiger I chassis with overlapping metal road wheels, although the prototype was built on an early Tiger chassis. There was an increase of sloped armor on the front hull to 150 millimeters, with the sides and back varying from 60 to 100 millimeters. The dimensions for these vehicles were roughly the same as Tiger I's, although they had a slightly lower profile and were a little bit shorter. They also had the same engine as late war Tigers, the Maybach HL230, and also carried the same transmission. Each vehicle does have its own little set of quirks though, which I imagine is just part of the learning curve of developing and creating these vehicles pretty much at the same time. For instance, all the mortars ventilation holes seem to vary from vehicle to vehicle, and there are also just certain things around the body of the vehicle that change from model to model. As far as crew goes, it had one less than a Tiger tank, with a commander, driver, loader, and gunner. The loader was also responsible for firing the machine gun in the bow and handling the radios. Due to the size of the shells, the vehicle couldn't carry too many of them. In fact, it was only rated to carry 16 rounds, and that includes one in the gun and one on the loading tray. There was also a large crane put on the back of the vehicle to assist with lifting the shells and loading them into the specially designed hatch on the roof. And I imagine this action was a job and a half for all four crew members involved. Once produced, the vehicles were distributed to three armored assault mortar companies. 1000, 1001, and 1002. Mortar Company 1000 saw action at the Warsaw Uprising, being used for its design purpose of accompanying the infantry, and the other two companies saw action on the Western Front both in the Arden Offensive and at Remagen, with less than desirable results, as they had to be resupplied often due to the limited number of rounds they carried. In fact, most Sturm Tigers were abandoned after they ran out of ammunition and their crews had no way of getting any more. There is, though, one unconfirmed report of a single Sturm Tiger shell taking out three M4 Shermans somewhere on the Western Front. Now, I would stop short of calling this vehicle an absolute failure due to the fact that when used in its role in Warsaw, it was very successful, and due to the fact that with so few made, it probably didn't make that much of an impact on the German war economy, but still, it just shows kind of how out of touch the German high command was with the war they were fighting. This vehicle, which is meant to be used in a purely offensive role, is proposed in September of 1943, after Operation Citadel and the last German major offensive. Oh, no, this is, this is not okay. The Germans are going to be on the defensive from this point on, and they know it. At this point, when every moment and every scrap of metal counts, to waste time and resources on a thing like this for something that's never going to be able to really be used in its intended role is just a waste of time. It just goes to show how out of touch German vehicle development was from the facts on the ground, thinking that it was maybe somehow going to turn around or somehow they'd be on the offensive again when that just wasn't the case. Oh, fuck! There are two of these things left though, one captured by the Americans on the Western Front at the Deutsches Panzer Museum, and a second one captured by the Russians that now resides in Kublinka, Russia. Also sorry for the lack of Sturmtiger footage, there's honestly not a lot, and there's not that many pictures either, so I'm sure there's going to be a lot of things in this video that are other vehicles, Tiger ones, things like that that are sort of unrelated.